On today's show, we'll go through all of the details with Sadiq Baywatch at this point in time with the Hawks awaiting word on a four-team trade. Will it happen? Will it not happen? We'll go through all the details there, as well as a nice win for the Hawks at home against the Spurs on this Saturday night. All that and more coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1411 of the Lots on Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Rowland, coming to you deep into the night on a Saturday into Sunday. And today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the most qualified candidates that you want to talk to for your job, and they help you to do it faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. I also want to encourage you, as always, to make us your first listen here at the Lots on Hawks podcast each and every day, wherever you get your podcasts. That includes Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and then also we are our YouTube podcast on the video side. Today's show will be multifaceted. Uh, later on in the podcast, we'll get into what became a nice win for the Hawks on this Saturday evening against the San Antonio Spurs, taking care of business in a big way for Atlanta in the second half in particular. And then uh, at the top of this podcast, we'll be talking about the Sadiq Bay mess that has been happening in the last two days. So we'll start there. Uh, usually I will start with a game when there is a game to talk about, but this is one of those where the game was interesting for sure. But uh, this is uh, one of those like national news kind of things that certainly impacts the Hawks and transactions drive the day in the NBA when it comes to February. So I recorded two podcasts on Thursday. I would encourage you to listen to those shows still wrapping up the deadline in a big way. Basically, the first one was an emergency podcast on the two transactions that the Hawks did on Thursday afternoon. And then there was another podcast that evening after Hawks Suns with game coverage, but also sort of the final analysis and all that stuff about the transactions earlier in the day. On that second show, I talked about the fact that the Hawks had officially announced deals that they actually made. And that means uh, one of those deals was sending five second round picks for Sadiq Bey in a four team deal that involved the Pistons, the Warriors and the Blazers in addition to the Hawks. However, the announcement of a deal does not technically mean that, it, that, that the deal is completely official because teams have the right to a physical on any player that they are acquiring uh, there's a 72-hour window, basically, in- inherent in all these transactions that unless a team waives that right, they have all that time to take physicals and for the deal to be actually rubber stamped by the league and the teams involved. 99% of the time, I would say, that doesn't actually matter on the outside of things to the point where, um, let's just as an example, Landry Fields and Nate McMillan talked about Sadiq Bay by name on Thursday evening. That was very much not out of the ordinary at all. It was a very normal thing to happen. They had already announced the trade, et cetera. But it does matter, unfortunately, for the Hawks in this case. Nate said on Thursday that the Hawks expected Sadiq Bey, in addition to Garrison Matthews and Bruno Fernando, to um, arrive in Atlanta on Friday, take their physicals, importantly, and then uh, maybe be ready to go as soon as today on Saturday. Well, Bey was in Atlanta. He was with the team, but he was not eligible to play in the game tonight because, as I record this, on Saturday evening, again, it's very late in the evening on Saturday into Sunday, as of right now, the deal has not been completed because... Uh, let's go back to Friday night. Sham Sarania and Anthony Slater of The Athletic reported that the deal, quote, could be in jeopardy, end quote, because Gary Payton II failed his physical with the Warriors. Payton was a part of the deal going from Portland to Golden State. This is not a Portland or Golden State podcast, so I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of all of that stuff. But there were some pretty interesting a- a- allegations, basically, from the Warriors, like about you know tore it all and Payton not being healthy and having a core muscle injury and it being kind of covered up in some respects. And uh, at the end of the day, the Warriors believe that Peyton has a multi-month injury that the Blazers did not really disclose to them at this point in time. So after all of that, other sources have confirmed it and reported the same thing. And again, as of Saturday night, there's no resolution to this. Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN reported multiple times tonight on TV and also in print that the Warriors have until 9.30 Eastern time, p.m. Eastern time on Sunday, which is hilariously right in the middle of the Super Bowl, but still to decide on whether they're actually going to approve the transaction or not. So I'll spend a few minutes now on the top of the podcast, kind of setting the stage for what's going to happen there and what could happen there if the Warriors were to rescind the trade. First, though, the Hawks did nothing wrong here, but they're also at the mercy of the other parties and kind of just have to wait out what's going on here. The reporting lays out uh, specifically that the Warriors would have until the window closes to essentially accept whether the deal is going to go through for the entire thing or – they can kind of sink the deal for everybody if they say no to the transaction. 
while it doesn't happen often, there are plenty of examples of trades in the NBA that have been killed due to failed physicals. That happens, you know, every couple of years. Generally speaking, there's, there's one like this. This one's more odd, though, because it involves four teams and it's a deadline deal, which means there's not really a lot of recourse. And two of the teams, including the Hawks, aren't really involved in the drama, but they're also wrapped up in the transaction. So according to the letter of the law, and this is something, this is something Woj said as well tonight. Uh, others have reported this as well. I've seen it. The entire deal would have to be rescinded if the Warriors back out of the trade. And they would be, by the way, well within their rights to do so. Obviously, it would not be great for the Hawks, but the Warriors, uh, it's hard to blame them for stepping out of the trade because they were, especially if they found this physical thing was uh, you know, not revealed to them and he failed the physical, et cetera. Um, every trade, by the way, in the NBA is, quote, pending physical. You never talk about it because of how often it doesn't matter. But it matters sometimes, and uh, that's, a, that's an important caveat. Since the reporting, I've talked to a lot of people around the, C- around the league who know the CBA a lot better than I do. Um, but basically, again, the letter of the law is because the deadline is pat. That's, that's a very important part of this. If this deal was made in January, they could probably just amend it and fix it and agree on, on a new solution. But because the deadline has passed on Thursday, the trade can't be changed. That's something Woj was saying in very plain terms on Thursday. There are some people who believe the league could override that or maybe could get creative or work with the Warriors and the Blazers on a solution or whatever. Um, I'm not going to rule that out because, you know, the league has some power, obviously, in the situation. But broadly speaking, um, it's more likely, it seems, that the Warriors might, might, might be a, a sort of rewarded like a pick later on for the for the Blazers covering it up or whatever. There's um, examples of that in the past as well. But again, Woj left no room for interpretation on this. And uh, as far as the actual rule is concerned, it seems to be pretty cut and dry. The Warriors basically have to say yes or no to the entire transaction. So we're talking through scenarios now because an announcement could come at any moment. And quite frankly, if it comes on Sunday afternoon or evening, I'm going to be covering the Super Bowl. So it won't be an emergency podcast. And really, this is a situation where there won't be a lot to like cover up, uh, sort of cover after the fact. I'm just going to lay it out now of what's going to maybe happen. And then we'll have more on this on Monday when the Hawks are back in action against the Hornets. Uh, first, again, from the Hawks standpoint, this is brutal for the Hawks. They obviously wanted to do this transaction, no matter what you thought of the transaction and like, I talked about the nuances of like how much they paid for it and all that stuff, but also said, you know, the Hawks got better in this deal and that's the bottom line. And, you know, even beyond that, the Hawks obviously wanted to do this transaction or they wouldn't have done it. So, and they did nothing wrong here. So, but there's also like no recourse at all for Atlanta. So that's pretty brutal. Fans are mad about this. I don't blame you at all. Obviously it would have been nice to have Sadiq Bay even in the lineup tonight, all that stuff. I don't blame anybody for being upset about it. It's definitely frustrating and it's uh, it might uh, just be unfortunate for the Hawks, honestly. And I think that Atlanta will be very rightfully annoyed at the very least if the deal does not go through. Um, we'll see. As for the details, one important thing that I got questions about is basically um, whether or not the other deal would stand for the Hawks and the Rockets. And it would stand. Uh, the Matthews Fernando trade has gone through. That is, there's no no issues there. It's a separate transaction. So the Hawks will have Garrison Matthews and Bruno Fernando on their roster. I have to say, that I don't think, I want to be clear about this, I don't think, I'm not reporting this, I don't think the Hawks would have done that trade if not for the Bay trade going through alongside it. Now, that does not mean definitely by any means, but a big part of the Matthews-Fernando transaction was because of the fact that the Hawks needed to cut salary to get under the tax while taking Bay in the other transaction. And look, they actually got better in the basketball sense, in my mind, acquiring Matthews and Fernando in exchange for Justin Holiday and Frank Kaminsky. I think Garrison Matthews is the best is the best player in that trade, and Bruno is an upgrade on Frank Kaminsky. So I'm not bashing it by all, at, at all. I think it's a totally fine transaction. I just think that part of the motivation from what I have heard, uh, and also just common sense, would tell you that the Hawks made that transaction. Uh, a big part of that was because they wanted to get under the luxury tax, and w- with taking on Bay, they had to cut money, namely with Justin Holiday. So would they do it again? I don't know, but you know. It's not, it's not the worst thing in the world, necessarily, again. They, they saved some money. Matthews could definitely help them on the perimeter. Bruno is an upgrade on, on Kaminsky. And uh, that monetary savings you know, isn't quite as impactful without Bay on the roster to get under the luxury tax, but it still helps them in some respects. But, obviously, the Hawks actively wanted Sadiq Bay, and he was clearly the best player they acquired at the deadline and the biggest investment they were making, given that they were paying five second-round picks to get him. He signed for two years, etc. Uh, if the deal got rescinded, the Hawks would get their five second round picks back. And as a reminder, those picks are in 2024, 25, 26, and 28 from the Hawks. And then the 2023 pick, that it's actually the second most favorable pick between Atlanta, 
Brooklyn and Charlotte, which is also just Atlanta's pick in 2023, essentially. So there are some protections on a couple of those picks 20, uh, in 24 and 25. That's a rabbit hole that, we want, that we're not going to go down now. But essentially, the Hawks will get their picks back, and they could use those for future business. They could draft players. They could trade. And uh, I have to say this. Hopefully, Tony Ressler would not just sell those picks. Uh, the Hawks have sold picks in the past. I have criticized them for that, I think, because – uh, you know, my big thing is that selling picks does not really help you. Even an overpay in a trade is better than selling picks, which which I, def- I definitely made sure to say that on Thursday. Even if even if you thought that it was a, an overpay in the transaction, when you compare it to the Hawks selling picks in the past, it's a better outcome to actually use those picks for a basketball purpose, whereas selling picks has no basketball purpose at all. Anyway, again, the Hawks would also open up a roster spot without Sadiq Bay. Now, they don't want to have a roster spot, but it would be kind of interesting to have one they could sign a buyout market guy. They could sign a uh, more developmental piece. They could convert someone from a two-way, et cetera. There's some flexibility there that they, that they don't currently have if they have a full contract. Um, and I guess the small bright spot on this would be that the Hawks didn't really shake up their actual core with this transaction. So they could still operate in the same way. And they're still a pretty good team, even without Sadiq Bay on the roster. You know, clearly the biggest appeal of the trade – and getting Bay was just adding to the depth. You know, Landry Field said that repeatedly in his post game, sorry, post trade press conference. Um, I think it's very obvious if you're looking at the way the Hawks roster has been built this year that the deep bench and the depth overall has been a weak point of the team. Adding Bay to that certainly would help them. But also, they didn't trade Collins, they didn't trade Bogdanovich. There would have been much worse scenarios involved here if the Hawks had, more, had been more reliant on Sadiq Bay. For this year, like if they had traded Collins and part of that plan was to replace some of those minutes with Sadiq Bay, that becomes a lot harder to walk back in a transaction where you have no control and gets rescinded. Now, yes, Bay would really help them. He would certainly provide depth, but they have a plan already. We, we've been seeing it every night. You know, tonight they, they played without Sadiq Bay and it was very similar to their previous rotations and all that stuff. So anyway, um, that's a small win. And just a bad situation, but at least it wasn't like a total like roster changing set of transactions. It's more about you know the money stuff and also adding depth. So again, overall, it's a spot where the Hawks just have to wait on the league and the teams and the Warriors in particular for the official ruling. They can't really do anything about this. And even if at the league through a Hail Mary and granted an alteration, it probably wouldn't impact the Hawks necessarily directly. So um, we'll get word on this between now and Sunday evening. Um, for what it's worth, I've taken kind of an informal poll of people around the league. And no one believes that the workers are likely to blow up the deal, but they also can't rule it out. It's one of those situations where it feels like the more likely scenario, just by you know history going through what, what would benefit the Warriors in particular right now, um, it feels like they probably will just let the deal go through, which of course was what the Hawks want to happen. But we're all guessing on some level, and the Warriors obviously made a stink to have this be reported this broadly and have this take, have this, have this, take this long. They're at least considering basically killing the deal. So we'll see how that all transpires. But um, if you're waiting for an emergency podcast, it won't be coming on Sunday unless something beyond this happens because I just laid out all of what's transpiring either way. If it gets if it gets killed, all of this applies. If it doesn't get killed, we're back to where we were on Thursday and Bay will be uh, reporting. He's, he was actually with the team tonight. Nate said he was in the locker room for uh, during, sorry, before and before after the game. He just can't participate on the floor, which makes sense. Obviously, you can't play a guy before he's been approved to be on your team. But uh, he's around the team, and uh, we'll get into all of that more And uh, when it comes to Monday, once we get word on this on Sunday. But follow me on Twitter if you want the real-time stuff, at BT Roland. Follow me also on Patreon, patreon.com slash BT Roland for the written content there. But now, you know, everything that I know as of Saturday evening into Sunday and what will happen either way. All right, that's enough on that. We'll get into the all of this stuff from Hawks Spurs this evening. But first, a word from our sponsors on the show today. Today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. As a small business owner or hiring manager, you know the success of 2023 is all dependent on the members that you have around you on your team. And that is why LinkedIn Jobs is a fantastic option for you. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching the open roles that you might have, people who have the skills, the values, and the experiences to help you achieve your goals as a team. I've used LinkedIn Jobs a number of times in the past, and it's proven to be an awesome resource for me. It makes a hiring process perfectly easy and painless. They help you to attract qualified candidates to your open jobs by using targeting tools, and they help you to make it very easy by screening applicants based on your job qualifications all in one platform that go beyond the resume data by using insights from your job post, your company, and their millions of profiles across their uh, platform. And they put the posts in front of a lot of different people, uh, the most qualified people possible, honestly. 
and they also do it quickly, and they do it for free. LinkedIn Jobs is rated number one in delivering quality hires against leading competitors, and they help you to find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to, and they help you to do it faster. That is a very important aspect of this entire thing, uh, faster and for free. One more time, post your job for free at linkedin.com slash LockedOnNBA. That is linkedin.com slash LockedOnNBA. Terms and conditions apply. All right, we'll dive in now to a basketball game that transpired on Saturday evening. The Hawks get a win 125 to 106 over the Spurs. And I have to open with a little bit of context on this game. Number one, it was the first time for DeJounte Murray facing his old team. He had never played for another team before, besides the Spurs coming into the year. This is the first game between the Hawks and the Spurs this season. So I'm sure an emotional night for him. Uh, he was pretty bad in the first half and then had a good second half, which is nice to see. I'm sure it was a big game in his brain along the way here. But beyond that, it has to be said and noted and emphasized that the Spurs are very bad. And this is a game where if the Hawks had lost it, it would have been their worst loss of the season, probably on paper. Um, it was the largest point spread of the season for the Hawks as a favorite. They were minus 13, according to our friends at FanDuel. And the Hawks had not been favored by even 10 points in a game since the first week of the season back in October. So essentially, it was their quote unquote easiest game of the season when it comes to the point spread and the situation. Number one. The Spurs came in on an 11-game losing streak, which is now 12, of course. They have the worst net rating in the league. They have the worst defensive rating in the league. They were missing a few key guys in this game, including Devin Vassell, who might be the best player at this point in time. Also, beyond all of that hilarity, the Spurs were coming on the second night of a back-to-back -back with travel from Detroit, and that game on Friday night was double overtime. So it would be very hard for the Hawks to have an easier situation on paper in an NBA game than they did tonight. Now, I always say nothing is ever assured in the NBA, ever. You're still, play, you're still playing as professional basketball players. These guys are going to play hard. And in the first half, the Hawks looked kind of vulnerable. They didn't play very well, as we'll get, as we'll get, we'll get into in a second. But um, it would have been a bad loss. And while a 19-point win is always nice, it's not quite the same as beating a real good team by that, much, by that many points. It was also why it was a little bit easier to leave with the other non-game stuff on this night. But still, a taking care of business win for Atlanta, for sure. And the big thing is, the third quarter was where the Hawks broke the game open. Um, we'll come back to it, but the Hawks won the third quarter by 15 points after a pretty shaky first half. They held the Spurs to 17 points in the third on 5 of 23 shooting with seven turnovers in that period. And they shot 52% from the floor on offense with two turnovers. And it was basically night and day on defense in particular between the first half and the second half. Amit McMillan got asked after the game what changed, and he said he couldn't reveal that or what he said, basically. Uh kind of in a joking manner, but obviously the intensity was ratcheted up. The execution almost is more important than the intensity in some ways was much better. They were better in rotation. They were better sort of you know digging down and just kind of being attentive. And it felt like the Hawks like had the light come on at halftime. And it happened sometimes, and that's what happened in this game. As far as the offense is concerned, it was a solid performance on the whole, a 118 offensive rating for Atlanta in this game. That isn't crazy high against a very bad defense. Um, because look, the Spurs came into the night with the worst defense in the league by more than two points per 100 possessions. So basically, they are atrocious. Right now, they have the worst defensive rating in the history of the NBA. One more time, the history of the NBA, and they were weakened by their absences. They're dead last in field goal percentage allowed, dead last in points in the paint allowed, dead last three point, three point percentage allowed, assists allowed, etc. They're horrible on defense. But the Hawks did play well in a lot of different areas. So 29 assists, 10 turnovers. That's a heck of a ratio. Um, almost almost three, three, three to one there. They, scored, they had 70 points in the paint. I asked Nate after the game if he was emphasizing that and basically said you know, it's, it's always an emphasis for them, but also talks about DeAndre Hunter and particularly attacking the rim, which definitely happened in this game. And the Hawks did a good job putting pressure on a Spurs team that was playing up defensively. They were trying to push out and pressure up on the floor, which can be effective, but certainly you know, Hawks were sort of able to navigate that, get to the rim. And the front court in particular was very efficient and good getting to the rim and attacking and finishing. Also, Trey Young was very good on this night. A season high, 17 assists for Trey. We'll come back to his performance later on, but one short of a career high there. Every starter had 14 points or more. And the glass was very friendly for the Hawks as well. Second chance points, et cetera. And they did a good job on, on the offensive end of the floor. Defensively, they held the Spurs to exactly a point per possession in this game. That's very strong, obviously. The Spurs did have some like no hope lineups on offense, but they shot 29% from three. The Hawks have been pretty good three point defense most of the season. And the Spurs had an 80 
offensive rating in half court sets. So when the Hawks were able to actually get set defensively, they were really stingy in this one. And uh, they, they were very sound out for halftime in general. They created 20 turnovers. That's a lot of defensive turnovers for sure. They were plus 10 in the turnover margin. That's always very helpful. It did allow 58 points in the paint. That's way too many against any anyone, much less the Spurs. But that was kind of the only black mark in a lot that was, was in the first half. So generally speaking, the Hawks didn't play a perfect game at all in this spot. I think it would be silly to suggest otherwise. Like if you just see, see the final result and say, all right, Hawks, Hawks won by 19 points. They, they must have played well. They played well in the second half. That's for sure. But you have to adjust a little bit for the opponent. But still, the Hawks basically could have played a C-minus game and won. And in the first half, they tried. They tried to play like a D-plus game and win. The fact they were only up one at halftime was an indicator of how bad they played in the first half, actually. But second half, they played very well. And that was good to see after the sort of the light came on through, through the halftime break. We'll have my normal game flow breakdown in a second and then we'll also get into uh, kind of the player by player evaluations at the end of the podcast. But probably speaking one more time here, a good taking care of business win for the Hawks. It isn't going to get anybody excited, but it does avoid disaster. And and basically, the second half was what you thought you might see in this game, especially the third quarter where the Hawks were genuinely good against an overmatched opponent. And the, you know the Hawks have been kind of famous this year for not always taking care of business, not always being sound against bad teams, not always taking care of leads. Uh, there, there have been lots of blown leads this year. None of that happened in this game. The Hawks were able to uh, overcome that slow start and get a nice victory. All right, we'll have more on the game flow in this one as well as, well as the individual breakdowns. But first, a word from our sponsors on today's podcast. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel, and the midpoint of the season of the NBA is behind us. The All-Star break is, of course, approaching. It's a perfect time to download FanDuel right now, and FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. New customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000, and that means bonus bets coming back to you if your first bet does not win at FanDuel. Just download the app right now, the FanDuel Sportsbook app, wherever you get your apps. And it's safe, secure, and easy to use. You can bet on anything that you're looking for, including point spreads and totals, money lines, and player props. There's no line just yet. On Hawks Hornets as I record this on Monday, but I imagine the Hawks will be favored in that game. And FanDuel will have you covered in a big way with all the context, all the lines that you need across the board for Hawks Hornets. And from there, you can find more exclusive bets at FanDuel, like the two times three, which is essentially where there'll be more than two three pointers in the first three minutes of an NBA game. Plus, FanDuel lets you combine your bets together for a bigger payout with a same game parlay. Those are a lot of fun. And don't miss the chance to get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That is FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsman partner of the NBA. All right, we'll hit the highlights now of what uh, kind of transpired here along the way. And the Hawks actually, actually trailed early on in this one. The Spurs made four of their first five shots. Defensively, they were missing rotations. They were sort of a step slow on defense, I thought, out of the gate. Um, the, the one bright spot early on was really the front court, the trio of DeAndre Hunter, John Collins, and Clint Capella. They actually scored their first 20 points for Atlanta. Not usually what's going to be happening there. They, they definitely started to attack the rim. I thought Hunter and Collins in particular getting downhill. Uh, Capella had dunks on lobs. He looked a little bit springy in this game, which is good to see. I thought Clint's been a little, kind of a half step slow the last couple games. Not so tonight. Hunter was getting into the teeth of defense repeatedly. Collins had this awesome finish um, early on in the game. Had a nice kickoff pass to Hunter. Um, Trey didn't take a shot in his first stint. That four assists and was playing well and playing under control. And the Hawks had a 15 to two run in that first quarter to go up by, I believe, eight points. Collins had this great spin move into a, a reverse finish. Um, not usually his bag off the dribble was actually a very nice move. He turned a lot of heads. Hunter had 12 points in his first uh, quarter stint. He was very aggressive in a good way. The Hawks had their normal rotation for the most part. It was nine guys, no surprises, kind of the usual stuff there. Um, the first points by either Trey or DeJounte didn't come for almost 10 minutes, which never happens. That's just crazy that that would actually happen for that, that, that long of a stretch. The Hawks won that by one point at the end of the quarter after a big late dunk by Spurs rookie Jeremy Sohan. And the Hawks were up by one despite having a 15-2 to two run in a quarter. That's actually kind of hard to do and not a great sign. But 24 of the 32 points were, were for the front court. Um, but offensively, kind of a slow start. Defensively, it was pretty bad other than the turnovers, as uh, we talked about earlier on in the podcast. Um, pretty slow start in the second quarter as well. I'll just say this as a broad takeaway from the first half. The bench was very bad in the first half. Very, very bad. The Stars were okay. Um, even though they weren't like in the world on fire either. Um, there was one nice big to big pass from a Kong Wu to Jalen Johnson for a dunk early on, but it was a 24 to 10 run by the Spurs extended to put the Hawks down by six points and force a timeout. The bench lineups were got, they basically just got rocked. They were minus nine from the time that the starters broke up. So basically anytime a starter left the floor, 
in the first uh, in the first half they were minus nine, and they were minus twelve in the Griffin Okongwu stint for about eight minutes. The Hawks were not scoring well at all. Once the Stars came back in, uh, it was sort of uh, back to business as usual. But only up by one at the halftime break because of the uh, issues there. They did have 38, 38 points at the paint. That was basically um, it was pretty rough stuff. Defensively, it was you know kind of a mess as well. And uh, while the front court was very good in the first half with thirty seven points, um, actually they were plus ten at least with all of the front court guys starting. And Trey had ten assists. But the other, the other five guys that played, so take out take away Trey, take away the starting front court of the three guys: Hunter, Collins, Capella. The other five guys, so Murray in the bench. Combined to shoot five of 21 in the first half and played very poorly. Fortunately, it didn't bite them in this spot. In the, sec- in the second half, as I said before, the third quarter was the one to circle a 14 to four run out of the gate to go up by 11 points. The Spurs missed their first seven shots and had three turnovers in the first five minutes. And the Hawks were very good defensively, really kind of flying around, executing well, definitely engaged, energetic, etc. It was kind of a nightmare for DeJounte Murray against his old team for a long time. Then he got five points in a row in the third quarter and had, uh, I believe, 14 in the second half. Good to see him sort of wake up there. The bench was much better. Um, still kind of booed by the starters in a lot of ways after halftime, but the bench was much better in the second stint than they, than they were in the first stint. And then Trey had a beautiful two-for-one at the end of the third quarter to go up by 16 points at the free throw line. He had 18 and 14 at the end of the third, and the Hawks were cruising based on the turnover margin. And basically, it was not – particularly um, up for debate in terms of the the final outcome by the middle of the third quarter, it was not over in terms of like actual terms, but it felt like the Hawks finally had the light come on and it was going to be a smooth sail. And it pretty much was Murray had 14 again, in the first 16 minutes of the second half, there was a pretty fast break engineered by Jalen Johnson. That was kind of a reminder of what he can do in transition. The Hawks went up by 20, about six and a half minutes to go. It was effectively over them. They were up by as many as 23 in the second half. Um, the starters did play way too long. I know that's kind of an on-brand thing for all parties. Number one, Nate for doing that. Number two, me for mentioning it. But it was kind of funny that the Hawks had their starters in up by 20-plus with like a minute and a half to go in the game. Kind of a silly thing there. But they won, this, they won the second half by 18 points. They will be spurs to 36% shooting after halftime and got it together on offense. It was a beautiful performance after halftime to make up for the first half swoon. Okay, we'll get into the individual player stuff now. And again, nine guys played real minutes. Uh, they, they did bring in Aaron Holiday and Tyrese Martin at the very end of the games for mop-up duty. They actually have some guys in the G League right, G League right now. Vic Krejci's in the G League, Trent Forrest in the G League, so they were a little bit shorthanded. Garrison Matthews and Bruno were technically active, although they were, they were not even in uniform, so that's kind of funny. Anyway, the guys who did play, um, I will say the guy who I think struggled was A.J. Griffin. He's been a little bit um, off the last few games, not in a terrible way. And again, it's a reminder that A.J. Griffin's not played a lot of basketball in the last few years. Uh, I'm sure the rookie wall is not always a thing that happens, but it would not surprise me if A.J. needs the break pretty badly here. Um, obviously, you think about old guys being that kind of number one thing that you know, guys like a, like, like a Pella and Bogey. But with A.J., he's not played a full season or anything close to this workload ever in his life. And uh, he looked kind of uh, off today. 1-7 from the floor, 0-3 from three. They had three rebounds, but had a turnover, two fouls. Just kind of a non-factor. Played pretty shaky defense, I thought, at times, too. So a bad one for him. He'll have better nights for sure, but uh, he was not very good in this one. Jalen um, wasn't great in the first half, like nobody was on the bench, but he was better in the second half. Uh, five points, six rebounds, did have a, an assist and a steal to go along with a turnover and two of four from the floor in 15 minutes of action. Bogey shot it well. He was 5-9 from the floor and three of three from three. And actually, I thought it was four for four. He took a three that was, I think they ruled it foot on the line. So I think he was four of four on jumpers outside of 22 feet, basically is the way I put that. Um, had two assists. He didn't play great, I didn't think, but he did, but he did shoot it well, which is uh, you know half the battle of Bogey th- th- this time of year. Akongwu was okay. Um, still sort of the same thing as everybody else off the bench, just kind of uh, asleep in the first half, better in the second half. And up with six points, three rebounds. Uh, Capella was much better, I thought, than Akongwu was in this game. But um, you know, Onyeka's actually, before tonight, had been playing great for a few weeks. And uh, nothing wrong with him having sort of a letdown game in some respects. Um, to the starters, all five guys did a lot of things uh, reasonably well. We'll go to Murray first. Um, he, had the, he was really the only guy who struggled in the first half, but he was much better after halftime. 18 points, seven rebounds, three assists in his game against the Spurs. Wasn't... Efficient, 18 points on 18 shots, but obviously was probably pressing early on. Um, he had a nice embrace with Greg Popovich that got ca- captured on camera a little bit. Um, you know, a weird night for him, I'm sure. But uh, he was a, he was definitely part of the solution after halftime, which was good to see. I, I would have uh, certainly felt bad if he had struggled the entire game. But he was he was much better in the second half. Um, 
Capella had a good night, 14 points, 12 rebounds, three blocks, and 29 minutes. Um, efficient, uh, great defensively. He was a game best, plus 27, flying around. It was good to see him look like Capella physically in this one. Um, obviously, it would be great to have him have a week off coming up soon, but he looked he looked to have his legs under him tonight, which was good to see. Uh, Collins had a good night as well, 17 points. Three rebounds only is not great, but two assists, two steals, two blocks, very active defensively. Uh, no turnovers as well for John. He got to got, got to the rim uh, pretty effectively, five of ten on twos, and this one got to the line four times, made, up, made all four. Not super-duper efficient, but certainly good defensively and productive. Uh, Hunter had a good night, especially early on. Um, ended up with 24 points on 13 shots. Got to the line nine times. I love that from Hunter. I know Nate called that out when I asked him about the points in the paint. I think that was an encouragement for Hunter. To, he talks about just how much of a weapon Hunter's jump shot is when it comes off of him getting to the rim and creating the extra space. I agree. I've always wanted Hunter to get to the rim more, all the way to the rim, not settle for that 15-footer, that 18-footer, that 20-footer, but getting all the way to the rim. He can shoot those mid-range shots, obviously, but good to see him using his body physically. Also 2 of 5 from 3 in this game. He played well. Had three steals as well. Not, not usually a habit creator, but was very active in this one. And then Trey. Uh, Trey was really good, I thought. 24 points. 17 assists, a uh, new season high, and also one short of a career high in assists in this game. Did have five turnovers, but that's totally fine when you have 17 assists. Obviously, you can live with that. Plus 24, had a steal. Um, he was 7 of 14 on twos, totally fine. 2 of 5 on threes, good. 4 of 4 at the free throw line, good. Uh, Trey was under control all night long. I can only think of like one forced shot from Trey all night. He only, he only took one shot in the whole first quarter, I think. He was uh, willing and able to be a facilitator. His passing is always great, but it was particularly really good in this game. He played good defense, I thought, on the whole in this one. So uh, really good to see him sort of setting the tone and uh, coming out and getting a, a dominant win in the second half of this game and uh, a cruise control victory on the whole. So with this win, the Hawks are 29-28, and 28, above 500 again. That's a nice place to be. And, uh, you know, in the standings-wise, I know Miami had a kind of a late-night win, uh, sort of a late-game win, I should say, um, on this Saturday. So as I look right now, as of late Saturday night, the Hawks are – in sole possession of eighth, um, a game and a half behind the Knicks for the seventh seed and three games behind the Heat for the sixth seed. We'll have more active night-by-night -night attention to the standings as the season goes along, but the Hawks are in solid-ish shape. Not where they wanted to be, for sure, preseason, but um, cer certainly in a decent spot, even if they don't have Sadiq Bay, as we talked about early on in this podcast. Okay, with that said, we'll get out of here um, on this night, but the Hawks are back in action on Monday. Another friendly matchup in Charlotte. Honestly, the Hornets are, uh, let's just say, not the best basketball team in the world. Now, now, they're still in better shape than the current edition of the Spurs were tonight. But the Hornets are currently, as I speak, dead last in the Eastern Conference in the standings. They're a half game behind the Pistons at 15-43. and 43. They've also lost seven games in a row. So, uh, yeah, that was on the road, so not quite as fortunate. It's also an early tip-off. It's a 7 o'clock p.m. game. On Monday, but another game the Hawks will be favored in unless something crazy happens, according to our friends at FanDuel, and uh, we'll have full coverage of that game when we get there. So, one more time, I plug my earlier comments about Sadiq Bay. Um, well, no, no, nothing emergency podcast happening on Sunday. That's all. Of, that's all I got for now. If something crazy happens, maybe we'll jump in. But Super Bowl Sunday, a full work schedule for me and all that. But please subscribe to this podcast across podcast platforms. Apple, Spotify, also uh, Stitcher and Overcast and all those places, Google Play. We're also on YouTube. Subscribe, auto-download, share it. Um, ratings and reviews are always positive as well. Tell a friend about the show, and uh, I really appreciate all the support on all of that. Follow the show on Twitter at LockedOnHawks. Follow me on Twitter at BT Roland. Follow my Patreon, patreon.com slash BT Roland for written content about the Hawks. I appreciate everybody listening to the podcast. Enjoy Super Bowl Sunday. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we'll see you all next time.